It is 33 million 837 365. That's up about a little over 2% from FY18. As you work your way down the sheet, um, we have subsidies to our transportation enterprise fund of 235,575. I think as the committee knows, um, you know, you don't have to go far uh, from Boston to understand that transportation equals subsidy. So from the beginning days of transportation, we've been talking with the finance committee about, <clears throat> you know, how transportation needs a subsidy. Um, our ambulance enterprise fund, uh, that was constructed back in FY 2010. And the way we built that was uh, the subsidy from the general fund was for roughly half of the eight staff assigned to the ambulance. And in fact, the first subsidy was about 270,000. Um, that was what we plugged in every year. Uh, for a couple of years, we didn't put in a subsidy or for I think FY 17 or 18, but we're back with a subsidy for the ambulance enterprise fund. Again, these subsidies are critical for the operation of these funds. And DOR, uh, the Department of Revenue, they absolutely have no problem at all with subsidies and enterprise funds. In fact, all of their forms accommodate it. So, you know, those are the big items. We also have some capital. As you said, Mr. Chairman, we have a, <clears throat> a little bit of an aggressive uh, bonding bill or a bond schedule. Uh, we have a bunch of projects on there that the first year interest is about $100,000. We also have some capital we're going to pay for in cash. Uh, our initiatives to keep the train whistle ban in place and also a bike share program. So if you tally, tally all of those up, it comes to 34565022 That's a 2.54% increase from 18. And good heavens, it actually ties out to the ALG plan. <laughs> so that's a very good thing for this time of year. Um, because there's no time before tomorrow to fix it. <laughs> Good point. So ALG is tomorrow morning, <clears throat> but we, we walk into ALG tomorrow morning uh, balanced uh, for FY19. But that's kind of a high level, you know, walk through. And what we tried to do, because the, the municipal, it's not that easy to tie out the total spending. And in fact, when, you know, there's five different articles here. Um, you know, Assistant Town Manager Hall also does a spreadsheet by article, and I think that was forwarded to the committee yesterday. And as you'll see, these things, they all kind of come together as we lead up until April 2nd, uh, opening night of town meeting. But from a high level, that's, that's our budget uh, that we're presenting. I don't know if Mr. McMullen has anything to add. No? Nice job. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, yes, Roland. What, wasn't there a thing that I saw on the Board of Selectmen that we, they were getting money from, I believe, Protect Towing for the bike share program? I'm not sure how much that was, and yes. I read it quickly the other night, and then I kind of forgot the number. But Yeah, so there's a couple of different, there's a match to that, but I think you're right, Roland, that there has been a couple of companies that have stepped up. Um, you know, I think in our world, uh, there's a pledge, and then there, as the, the FinCom knows, because you're all kind of in this line of work, there's cash on the table. I think these were pledges that we received. So we're leaving the 9,000 in um, just to make sure that the program gets off and running. It's a two-year program as well, Rowan, so I think we can use some of those funds if they do come in for the second year match. All right, the way this will work is I'll go down article by article. If, um, if there are questions on the article, um, ask them. Uh, so we'll start with Article 4, which is the town operating budget. Uh, you have a draft warrant in front of you. I believe the language won't change. Um, and it is... On page 22. And the amount we're talking about is 33,837,365. 
So, questions on the town operating budget? Thirty-three million eight hundred three seven three sixty-five. Any questions? Since Dave's not here, uh, and this is his article, and I'll ask somebody else to propose a motion. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we recommend Article 4 of the Town Operating Budget. Um, discussion? Any discussion? <laughs> all right. Um, all in favor of recommending Article 4, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Abstentions? Article 4 is approved unanimously. We'll move on to well, let's do Article 22, Transportation. Okay, 22 is now the Ambulance Enterprise. <laughs> and so either Christine or Christy has this one. Are you ready to make a recommendation? If not, we'll move on. Uh, I recommend we approve the, uh, yeah, an the Ambulance Enterprise Fund. Um, okay, first let me say, uh, is, do we have any questions sorry. on the Ambulance Enterprise Fund? Questions? Uh, anybody? Now you can say it. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move we recommend. Mr. Chairman, I move we recommend Article 22. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all in favor of recommending Article 22 say aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Abstentions? Okay. It passes. Now let's try Article 23, Transportation Enterprise Fund. Any questions? Any questions? Oh, come on, it's gotta be questions on Transportation Enterprise Fund. There's always questions. <laughs> <laughs> You're here to answer questions, Mr. Barry, not ask them. All right, then I'll entertain a motion on Article 23. Mr. Chairman, I move that we uh, approve, uh, recommend Article 23. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Okay, seeing done. All in favor of recommending Article 23, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Abstentions? <coughs> okay, Article 23 is recommended. <coughs> At this point, gentlemen, I will ask you to step aside and we'll move the, to the CPC. I know you're on a hot streak, but we gave them a time and they're here. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Sorry. 
the ghost coming. Um, this is Walter Foster, chair of the Community Preservation Committee. Are you chair for life, or is there going to be oh, an no, to unseat you no, these days? <laughs> Term limits have applied. <laughs> If, if, if you would, Walter, you could introduce the members of your committee Thank hiding you. in the seats. <laughs> so with me tonight is Ray Jacoby, who I know you know from Planning Board, Dean Charter, who is a member, uh, and the Tori uh, Byer in the back, and Amy Green, and those are the members of the committee that are here this evening. We have, uh, I think we number 11 or 13 or some number, some large number, but we have a good contingent here this evening. All right, the floor is yours. Great. Um, so I'm happy to walk you through, as you know, uh, Roland uh, uh, Borden is the uh, representative who comes religiously to our meetings. Not only is he intimately knowledgeable about the CPC, but was for many years a member and a chair of the committee. So we appreciate his services and my understanding is hopefully he's kept you appraised of our workings. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what you have, hopefully there are two pieces, um, typically CPC, of course, funds uh, within four categories of projects. So they're either open space, recreational, affordable housing, or historic based. Um, CPC has been, you know, part of now the active landscape for a number of years. I think we're at like 14 or somewhere around that, that many. And each year we have a number of projects. So we have a spreadsheet that hopefully has been shared with the FinCom um, that goes down. We took our final votes uh, for appropriation, and I'll walk you through essentially our spreadsheet, but, but the projects that we're looking to put forward this year. We respectfully ask for your uh, support for this. It, it means a lot on town meeting floor when there's a recommendation from the FinCom. So happy to address questions about the specifics, but I'll take the overview first and just walk you down our spreadsheet. Okay. So um, to what we have as the first project is the RHSO, which is Regional Housing Services um, Office. And we have funded this a number of times in the past. It is a great regional uh, program that we partner with many other cities and towns where we get the support services needed to administer all of the affordable housing programs uh, through our two bodies here in town, two uh, standing committees that deal with that. The um, requested amount for that is uh, $50,000. Uh, is that right? Seven, yes. Um, uh, and it funds it for two years. The next project is we had a request of $75,000 uh, for new affordable housing uh, units from the M uh, Acton Housing Authority. The total amount there is for $75,000. This is for a fund that is not designated at this time for a specific development or a specific site. It is a fund that they use to look at potential either purchases of like buy down for condos or new affordable housing sites. So there's no specific project associated with these funds and it's a project or if you will a, a, a project that the applicant has brought to us many years, uh, many times before and we have funded almost every year. Um, the next one is a, a, a request for $75,000. This is also from the Acton Housing Authority. And it's to, um, for the McCarthy Village, this is dedicated to a specific affordable housing site for siding and decking replacement um, in the amount of $75,000. Then we have uh, the Habitat for Humanity came to us and there's, they're broken down into two specific requests because it hits two of the categories, both historic and for affordable housing. So on the um, uh, affordable housing piece, it's a request for $53,000. And this is, of course, through ha we've done one here already in town for Habitat for Humanity at 4345 School Street. They, of course, have usually the owner who will be the owner occupier, donates all of their labor. There's tons of donated labor through Habitat for Humanity. And they came to us for the construction part of 53,000. And then there's, because it's a historical resource, there's 38,650. So the total amount of that project is around like 91,000. But it, because it goes into those two different buckets, we're uh, looking to fund it that way. 
Um, under his, the category of historical, the Acton Historical Society came to us for the Hosmer House, which is everybody knows is kind of right opposite, not your average Joe's. And this is to basically to restore and do a campus and architectural um, um, upgrade and preservation of that site um, in conjunction, I know J.D. Head is here this evening in conjunction with the school. It's an accident. I know. <laughs> There's a synergy there because a lot of the schools use that property sometimes to kind of cut through to not your average Joe, so they're going to be formalizing that. The applicant has worked closely with the schools where to make it both the safe passable but also really expose our kids of course to the great historical resource uh, that the Hosmer House is. Um, in addition from uh, the town of Acton again under the historical uh, uh, heading it's the Kennedy Building Rehabilitation at Woodlawn Cemetery. There are a couple of Woodlawn Cemetery requests and these came through of course through the cemetery commissioner. Um, but through the town of Acton. And we, the committee uh, voted to approve 25,000. That's severely or greatly lever leveraged. There's 130,000 coming from the cemetery commissioners. And then I think about 20,000 from the town budget with the contribution from the, um, uh, from the CPC of 25,000, which is really geared towards making sure that they have a um, ADA compliant bathroom and it was kind of singled out as part of that project. Um, the CPC has, is moving to approve uh, that portion or that amount of monies. In addition and related, both of these are historical, the cemetery gates is three sets of wonderful entryway gates to Woodlawn Cemetery and they need to be repointed and taken care of before they fall apart further. So that is an amount of 31,000 that the committee has voted to appropriate. Um, again, under historical, um, through the town library, um, Arthur Davis, who is a wonderful, uh, uh, really uh, a valued treasure here at town, is an artist and, and painter, and many people in town are aware of his works. Um, the library came into uh, essentially the next of kin donated um, some wonderful etchings that are fat, that quickly deteriorating. So it's for the preservation and then to have those etchings be available and as a public display in the library. And the total amount on that is 10,500. That involves the restoration of most of the, of all of the etchings and then framing of some of the others and then uh, purposefully um, preserving the rest in either matted or, you know, kind of hermetically sealed conditions. Um, the next is the open space set aside. This is a typical project that we have funded for many years. And this year, we don't have a particular project that those monies would go to. They would go to what is called the open space set aside fund or the open space bank. And the amount on that is 500,000 this year. Um, in addition, the open space, whenever we have an open space project that comes into uh, to the town, there are related costs such as the 21E reports, legal fees, often conservation restrictions that need to be drafted. So uh, they created a support fund for the open space acquisitions. And we're funding that at 30,000 this year. That is something that is uh, replenished Every so year, every few years or so, I don't think we've done um, this project for at least three or four years, and there's about seventeen thousand in the in that uh, set aside fund. We do expect, and we're hearing hopefully, to have some specific projects come up in the next future years. So they want to be prepared and have those monies on hand. Um, then under recreation, again through the um, town of Acton, uh, we have a project to make um, a, dis a disability accessible, a campsite at Camp Acton. And it really what it does is allows uh, for the kind of the stone, uh, a crushed stone pavement that allows both wheelchair and otherwise abled individuals to take advantage of Camp Acton. It has a um, a wonderful uh, kind of a both picnic table and fire pit that is uh, really geared towards and allows people with disabilities to take full uh, experience of the outdoors. And that amount is $10,012. Um, and another recreation project is the, um, the final piece of what is known as the TGO Grady Skate Park. 
So this is the, the skate park, the bowl that many of you might have seen that's really adjacent to the lower fields at the high school. This was one of the first projects for CPC. There have been two prior phases, and this is, we are told, the final phase of this. Um, there are leverage funds for that. The amount that we're appropriating is $76,000. we are told that this is ready to go. Um, uh, there are uh, the, the Town of Boxborough Recreation Department is looking to uh, provide some funds to that as well. But this would be the final piece. And what it does is it completes one other skateboard element in the final triangle that exists between the bowl and the lower fields. If any of you have either driven down there, there's this like kind of barren little triangle, and that piece would fill out the final part of the skate park. Um, in addition, uh, we have some narrow improvements, and these under the under the recreational heading, and that's to the amount of six thousand dollars, and that would fund a um, a ramp that would make the stage down at Nara be accessible to everybody, both wheelchair or otherwise abled individuals, and it's actually portable, so it can be used not only for the stage but for really any other elements if need be. But its primary use would be to allow the stage to be made accessible to anybody. Um, and finally, as the statute permits and what we do every year, we're permitted to allocate up to 5% of the uh, CPC funds to the program administration. And so you see that amount of 56,000. So those are the what are called the appropriation side. And just a couple of other points that I want to point out on this spreadsheet. As we're deep in, there's, there's all kinds of moving parts to it. Happy to answer any questions. But down below, in the open space set aside balance, you'll see that the current balance is 1.5 million and some change. Um, we had approved the Wright Hill purchase, and we bonded for that. So there's a yearly bond cost of 85000 and the committee voted to appropriate that out of the open space set aside. That would leave the open space set aside with $1.4 million, and we'd be appropriating an additional five. So if the town meeting votes, FinCon approves, and the town uh, body politic approves, there would be approximately $1.9 million in the open space set aside, which puts us in good stead to purchase new properties. Similarly, from prior projects, t typically when a project is over, they turn back money. Some projects, for some reason, sometimes cannot go forward. So from prior projects, we have a carryover from the prior year and a return of funds of $823 into our um, uh, historical, if you will, open space, uh, excuse me, historical set aside balance. That balance is 41,000. We're going to be allocating that to this year's projects, which draws down that op the historical open space to zero and then um, allocates it to a couple of the uh, various historical projects that I've described above. Similarly, the CH, which is our affordable um, set aside balance, is at 25,090. And again, those are from return funds. Uh, from prior projects. That balance will be applied to some of the affordable housing uh, category of projects up above and be drawn, drawn down to zero. Um, the other numbers that are on the, uh, the spreadsheet, just to give you, you know, the perspective, the amount collected on the surcharge by Acton was 956000 and some change. And then the matching by, uh, from the state was 164537 You can find this at the top of the spreadsheet in the middle. Um, we had some interest income of 11000 We had a rollover or unencumbered funds of 53000 from last year. And then we recaptured $93,000. So the existing available amounts are $1,281,000 uh, $1, from which could be appropriated this year. So that's, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, an overview. I know there are other members here, uh, Mr. Benson, I know, who've been on the committee and chaired it as well, that are very deeply familiar. And many of you have been on FinCon before and that we've been before are familiar with how this works. Happy to address any questions about either the projects or the proposed appropriations by the committee this year. And again, we request your support. Thank you, Walter. Um, most of us are looking at what's in the draft warrant and, and a couple of these projects sure. don't, ha don't have numbers against them. So. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so yes. what is the total amount being appropriated for okay. all projects? So <laughs> the total amount on our voted amounts would be 1.159 
1,159,131. So 1,159,131. It would leave a balance of 122,000 unencumbered in the uh, CPC, if you will, account. Okay. Questions? Jason? Uh, could you explain a little of the difference between um, item K and item O? K and O, sure. If, uh, if O is the, the administrative appropriation, it sounded a lot like K was an administrative appropriation as well. Ah, uh, yes. So the K ones are spent, the K funds, which is the open space set aside, are spent specifically for open space purposes as compared to just a purely administrative support for the committee. So the open space the, with the bucket that would be, you know, items that would be charged to that account are when the 21E report has to be done for a, um, you know, is there a contaminated land um, for work done by an evaluator or an appraiser in looking at a purchase of an open space, the drafting of a conservation restriction which must go on any open space, just those would come out of that fund. And we created a specific fund for that so that they would be, um, because those are attendant costs to the open space, so we carry it as a separate. Without the existence of K, the cost would would have just uh, flowed to O anyway, correct? Yeah, what would have happened is most likely without the existence of K, the open space requests that come to us would have those increased costs to them. So typically right now we, put, we have in the, if you will, in the open space set aside bank, 1.5 million. If they needed to do those functions, that those monies would be available and or they could specifically come and say, so for instance, in the fall we purchased a piece of land. They would have said the purchase price is just say 150,000, but we need 10,000 more for the attendant legal costs and the drafting costs. They would have added that and come to us and requested it to us as part of that project. So does this make it easier for the accounting side? It does. Does it, it also change the blend of what uh, project would ch charge out of one of the four buckets? Correct. That's exactly right. So each year we must meet, not, we have a minimum threshold of 10% appropriation into three buckets. The open space set aside bucket, the um, affordable housing, and the historical bucket. So not only to make sure that we meet those, although we far exceed that in the open space piece, but you are correct. It's to allocating them into those buckets as well. As, as well as in, because there are specific requests that come up that previously, in the first few years, we would get the project request, but then nobody thought about, oh, there are these attendant costs that are absolutely directly related to that project that would be reimbursable, but it's hard to anticipate those. So like we've done with others, we, they, we've gone down this route of creating a specific open space set-aside fund for those type of costs. Thank you. Ask Sure. Uh, item D, the development acquisition funds for new affordable housing units. You said that you do that at, to, at the rate of about $75,000 a year every year. Um, is, first of all, did I hear you properly on that? You did. And, and then the question then becomes, um, what uh, is, is it being used every year? Is it building a balance out there somewhere? And if it is being used every year, what does it equate to, you know, ballpark uh, per year for the number of new units and does that have an appreciable impact on our on our approach trying to get to ten percent for 40b uh, y yes it does it absolutely lends uh, and is a cornerstone almost all of the CPC funding for affordable housing to me is invaluable to reaching that ten percent um, and specifically last year for we did not it didn't pass a town meeting, actually, the 75,000. We had that request last year, but it didn't pass. In the year previously, I believe we did 50, and we did maybe 50 the two years before that, just to give you a sense. So there's been some years where it has, um, we haven't funded it, it's not, you know, religiously each and every year. Um, one example, as noted in the kind of summary, which I think you do have, this is in the draft warrant article, a similar appropriation in 2009 lever leveraged over 3.3 million in state and federal funds for the um, Wittesley Village. 
So there are two pieces that these are often used to, as you can see with the siding for the McCarthy Tower. One is to make sure that we maintain that housing stock. So I, I don't have the breakdown in front of me based on all the past years about how much goes to afford to acquiring the new units, but I can say maybe at least half of this, these type of funds, go to the um, preservation of like decking of the existing units so we don't lose any off of the 10%. Um, but a number of them, and I know of two projects in the last two years where the monies from the AHA side went to purchasing of new. And I, I don't have the exact, like what I would call the leverage numbers, but I can get that for you. Yeah, I, I'm just curious how far $75,000 goes in, yeah. in buying, a, buying a unit. And, and it turns out that at least the, the two places that I've seen, and I've been on CPC since its creation, the two places where I've seen the most leverage is actually the rail trails and in affordable housing. Because the leverage side there, the state matching, it's such a priority on the state level that there really are funds available. So um, just as with the rail trail that leverage almost three to one in terms of an average of the dollar that we put in that we get, we see as a return, the affordable housing has a very large return when it's used, for instance, in accessing the uh, grant programs on the state level. And I can get you those percentages. I, um, I don't know if other members know that percentage, but we don't have our affordable housing people here tonight, but it, it's very large, actually. I don't need it for tonight, but that's the type of information I would sure. love in the future. Absolutely. And then... Keep, keep going. Great. Uh, looks like the um, state matching funds came in around 17.3%. Uh, this is, is this is part of the trend that where it's continuing to fall, correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, it is. Do you expect a precipitous drop in the near future, or do you think it's going to be a slow degradation over we, the next couple of years? We don't. We actually expect it to grow next year. So we are a member of, there is a statewide uh, coalition that is very active up on Beacon Hill. Two things that have a direct impact on the matching funds is the general economy, and in particular, of course, people's purchases or using the registry of deeds, because that's where the state funds are generated from. What we hear this year is that the state has a windfall and is looking to put more monies into the CPC fund. And because there are 360 cities and towns, uh, we're now over 160. We're, we're, we're almost half, if not more than half, but some very politically powerful cities and towns are now in the CPC. They've been able to leverage that at Beacon Hill. And we hear, because we get the reports through the coalition that, that that covers this, that we're looking at, it's not going to be a huge increase, but that the matching funds will go up next year, maybe to the 20, 25%. Last one. Sure. Thank you. Um, for the Hosmer House campus landscape, yes. uh, item G, Yes. Um, I understand from what you just described that uh, a lot of that is uh, facing the school side, facing the school campus side. Uh, what, what Partial portion of that might become in jeopardy uh, as of having to be redone or being negated as a result of the Kelly's Corner uh, proposition that's going on as oh, well. Sure. So we, um, throughout the hearings that we had, we we're very attentive to this issue. And as you probably know, we have, a, of course, a, a sitting representative from the Board of Selectmen. Peter Berry was, uh, sits on the committee. And as part of this, um, we requested that the applicant uh, closely coordinate this project with the town. And this is my understanding as it sits here today. Um, the Kelly's Corner Initiative will help this project and will be coordinated with it to this degree. The rebuilding of the um, stone walls, which is a historic wall, and the uh, streetscape side, which is all within the purview of Kelly's Corner, will be literally the facing part of Hosmer. And the landscape architect will incorporate that into their design and work closely with the town to actually um, uh, capture, hopefully, we believe, some value where the Kelly's Corner Initiative will pay will be paying for like the sidewalks, which is the accessible piece, including the stone wall, and everything right behind it will coordinate closely with the Hosmer House. So typically what the CPC does in all of its award letters, it's able to put conditions on the awarding of these funds. 
And one of the ones that the committee has talked about that will be coming with this particular project is a close coordination with the town's efforts on that Kelly's Corner initiative. And if the Kelly's Corner initiative does not pass, do you, do you continue to move forward anyway? We would because, they're, they're, if you will, they're abutting, if you will, issues. So the Hosmer one, can, meaning the Hosmer CPC, the entire landscape behind essentially what, and, and I could be wrong and anybody else can weigh in, but behind the stone wall, that, that's really what this project, these project monies are for. So it is not going to be impacted by the Kelly's Corner? No, it, it really will not. In fact, it has to take into account whatever the Kelly's Corner um, initiative does. So um, it's, in, it's in both the applicant's interest and, of course, the town's interest to, as those projects move forward, both on a funding process, but about, okay, the wall should be here or whatever, that they have to reach agreement about that. And we're gonna condition our award of the funds to make sure that that happens. But the answer is if the Kelly's Corner Initiative doesn't like move forward, this can still happen on everything behind, if you will, the stone wall. And then when the Kelly's Corner Initiative goes forward, then the rest of that can happen right at the front. Are you done? I'm done, thank you. Other questions? Bob. To, to stay with the, uh, the Hosmer House, yes. did you uh, hear it all from a traffic engineer with regard to this? I mean, the idea of, of ex making more cars turn left into that little space, regardless of how big you make the space, where the state highway exits come up, where Acton Medical comes up, where the donut shop comes in at 27, I think it's a disaster in the waiting, and I cannot understand why anybody would spend a penny to increase the traffic turning in and off of 27. So did you hear from a traffic engineer or not? So, so we haven't. One of the requirements because that we would require is that for that project to move forward, it has to be coordinated with the Kelly's Corner Streetscape Initiative. That's, that doesn't solve the problem that you, you've got a mess that you're making worse. I mean, the traffic engineer may mitigate the mess, but it's still going to be a mess. I, 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 I understand your concern and the way that, at least to me, the CPC has looked at this is right now, of course, there is the turnoff. This isn't adding a turnoff. It would increase the turnoff. My understanding is it would double the driveway so that people coming in and out of that driveway would not hit one another. In other words, it would be a dual driveway. So it, it is a curb cut that already exists. And I, I, I understand the concern about that. and can certainly bring that back to the committee. It's, um, it's, it's not, I understand the curb cut is there, but, but you're proposing basically to increase the number of cars that you're using it. That's, that's my concern. And I understand. I, I, I think you should have, I don't want to argue with you, but I think you should sure. have looked much more closely at that than apparently the committee did. Other questions? I have a couple. Do you have uh, any open space parcels in your sites? Uh, so we, um, we, we invite the um, open space committee, and of course, as you know, in the fall, we, we purchase one. Um, there are, are two that uh, may be coming on. One is, is the uh, farm down by um, the South Acton train station that is adjacent to, I think it's called uh, the Liberty Tree Farm or the... Uh, Stone, Stonefield, sorry. I forget which one they call that David one. David Stone's house? Yes, that one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, but there, that, and then we've heard of two others, but what we have seen happen is that projects that you didn't think were going to happen jump to the forefront, and then others take the back seat. But right now, there's that one. And then... Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think. Yeah, that that's that's a big one where they might even have somebody who's coming in to look at um, essentially to to do farming, of course, and agricultural and etc. There was one other, but I, I I apologize, I'm not exactly sure its location in town. And um, as far as the McCarthy Village siding and decking yep. replacements. Um, do we have a, I guess, a master plan of, of what kind of work is needed to all the AHA facilities? And, and is, or is this, or do, you, do we take them one off? Yeah. <laughs> so I believe that the AHA 
and ACHC does have a master plan. So they have a plan that looks at the aging facilities and is done. I know on two of the facilities, particularly at McCarthy Village, we've done already a num number of projects to uh, preserve and make sure that those go forward. The committee, as we have it, because we ask, um, and it's uh, Nancy Kalb is this year's representative, mm -hmm. um, we do an open, uh, a plan at the beginning of every year and solicit from uh, all interest groups, you know, what are their, their future vision and the like. The committee doesn't have that plan in hand, and I can ask and get that to you, but um, typically, CPC gets the what I call more of the one-off, which is okay, and then it lies low for a few years, and then, oh, we need window replacement and, and the like. So I, I could get you a status update, but it would have to be from the applicants. That's fine. Yeah. I'd like that. Um, okay. Just for the benefit of the, some of the committee members, um, CPC can do maintenance on affordable housing units. It can't do maintenance on historic properties. Um, so... In case you're confused. All right, uh, any other questions or comments? Um, it's not happening, but you can ask the question. Has there been any conversation about, I believe it's River Street, correct, uh, being brought to you instead of uh, being held, just held by the town? Um, yes, in fact, the River Street came to us as a project this year and then was withdrawn by the town. Um, so we originally were approached by that for a plan, basically to do a plan and other pieces to that, but that project was withdrawn okay. in this year's cycle. Um, I know previously those were purchased with town funds and that at the time when that happened, that came to us as well, but we couldn't move as quickly. And it, it, anyways, the committee did not approve that. And what ended up being is the town purchased that. So we had heard that maybe the project of um, reimbursing the town for the purchase price was coming to us, but that has not happened either. So essentially from a CPC perspective, there's been, besides what I just described, there's been no other either, hey, heads up or actual projects that we've looked at at River Street at this time. How would you feel about it if it did come your way? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so typically, you know, um, uh, you know, the, com the committee will look at anything that fits within the eligible categories, and we're always advised by that. I think the CPC has been a great synergy with town projects and with, I would call, town both operating budgets where it's eligible. And to me, um, a plan that might include either, you know, um, a, a uh, preservation of open space or a you know, at some point affordable housing was being discussed or what have you, but at least doing the plan is absolutely in keeping with what the CPC has done on other projects. So, and my understanding is, is that the town has a committee that's ongoing to take a look at that. So when and if that town committee acts or the town and the board of selectmen or uh, uh, some other applicant, but here it would be the town, right, that may, you know, either is acting on that plan or says, you know, to these parts that are CPC eligible, the CPC will look at that um, in, in, in all of its merits. Thank you. And one final question, how um, is the lawsuit going on church versus uh, state? Or <laughs> so very interestingly, I'm glad you asked. We don't have a decision yet. So we're, we're waiting with bated breath from our Supreme Judicial Court where uh, people I know, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say, <laughs> brought that lawsuit on behalf of a uh, interest group, uh, of course, in Washington, D.C. And the issue is the, separate, the constitutional challenge under the mass constitution of the separation of what we would refer to as church and state, what some refer to as the anti-Catholic amendment passed in the <laughs> late 1860s. Um, and in any case, that case has been argued. It's gone all the way to the SJC. The SJC, two, like maybe four weeks ago, announced to all the parties that you Uniquely so, it's not issuing the decision within the time period it's required to do so. <laughs> it is taking more time to do so. So, um, as always, it's we're sitting there with bated breath. There are, uh, it's still one project in the works on that that will absolutely have an impact both statewide and, of course, it's a constitutional law claim. So it will have an impact on the state's constitution and anything that flows from that. Um, we do expect a decision, um, probably not by town meeting, but by June. 
Thank you. Um, are we ready to vote? Does anybody have any particular concerns? Can we vote it as, a, as an article, or do you want to vote them by, by project? Mr. Chairman, I recommend that we vote the entire Article 7 and 1. Okay. So you, you make, you're making a motion to uh, recommend? To recommend Article 7. It's community Preservation Seven. Program okay. Direct Appropriation from Fund Balances. Is there a second? Second. Say so moved and second. Any discussion? How does it normally work? <laughs> How does it normally work? Do, do these all come up individually, or is it all just one one vote? Um, it, it's treated at town meeting like a consent um, list, meaning um, okay. if somebody holds one, or if two people hold it, uh, it has a separate vote. But if if, the, if they're not held. Uh, at town meeting, then the whole article is voted. Interesting. All right, then uh, we are voting on the entirety um, of, I lost it, seven, seven. Article 7. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. We recommend Article 7. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Abstentions? Okay, Article 7 is recommended. Thank you, Walter. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time tonight. Thanks, Walter. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, do we want to go back to the town capital at this point? Did we lose Steve? <laughs> no, Steve's here. Okay, let's take a look at Article 10, Capital Infrastructure. Oh, are we ready to vote? Tom, do you? All right, I'm looking at this warrant. And the Capital Infrastructure Non-Bonding, which is the railway crossings and the bike share program. So any questions on these? Anything you want to say, Mr. Barrett? So Article 10, so Article 10, uh, we, we have these as listed as payments in cash in our world. These are not to be bonded. Um, the summaries are there. Uh, these have been vetted. And we would respectfully ask for the committee's approval of Article 10. Good question. Wait a minute. Tom, do you have any comments? Uh, I do have a question. Um, <laughs> initially, the, the regional bike share program was 36000 um, I know there was a, when we had the budget Saturday, there was discussion that a lot of that would be funded by local merchants and would come down. Is that, in fact, what's happened? Yeah, exactly, Tom. We, uh, and it's, I think that thirty six was over two years as well. But uh, do you remember who the, uh, the benefactor was? I forget now who came up. But... Uh, one of the local vendors oh, came up. Mm. So yeah, so there was a few vendors, Tom, that absolutely kicked in to lower that number. Um, but yes. Okay. Didn't the state kick in the cap? Any other questions? Jason? Just quickly, um, this being a, not a bonding topic, I'm curious why we call it capital. If we know it's going to come every three or four years and we have to recertify on a regular basis, why is this qualify as cap? And not just something that's we know is coming, but just doesn't happen to be annual. I mean, I appreciate that it's non-bonding, so therefore it doesn't violate my, my capital reserves <laughs> rules, but I'm, I'm just picking on the word here. So any, you know, in our world, the annual operating budget 
is just that. Anything other than that, we usually call capital. That it's a non-op, you know, annual operating type of expense. Um, would you propose another word? Give me time. I'm sure I will. <laughs> Any legitimate questions? <laughs> Um, so it has two pieces, the, the railway crossing safety improvements of 140000 and the regional bike share program of 9000 Are we comfortable voting on the, the total of Article 10? All right, Tom? Mr. Chairman, I recommend that we, uh, that we recommend Article You move 10. that we recommend. <laughs> In its entirety. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? In that case, all in favor of um, recommending Article 10, capital infrastructure, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay? Any nays? No? Abstentions? Okay, Article 10 passes. Um, do we want to go into the other capital article, Bob, tonight? Or? Okay. Article 8. Article 8 is the capital equipment infrastructure design services. It's bonded, uh, includes a North Acton fire station design, fire engine replacement, south and west fire stations, HVAC improvements, complete streets improvement program, and the Acton center traffic design. The total amount is $2,282,830. However, the FY19 impact is the first year's interest, which is $100,003. Am I correct? You are. I would, I would say that if you look at it, we pulled Kelly's Corner into a separate article, article number nine. So technically, that 100000 needs to be split over those oh, two articles. Okay. So we'll need to make that change um, because those Kelly's Corner are also proposed borrowing. That 100000 covers all the bond package that we propose. So we'll make that change to the spreadsheet, uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Bob, any comments? In the next fiscal year, what would the Article 8's cost be? Are you talking FY20 or FY19? FY20. This is FY19. I'd have to get those numbers here, Bob. We have some debt service numbers. I don't have them with me, though. They're, okay. Uh, but it would, it, would, it would be useful to know because the 100000 even if you split out Kelly's Corner, and this turns out to be $75,000 uh, for Article 8, uh, you're, you're promising the taxpayers a big increase in Article 8 next year, and it would be nice to know how much it is. Um, the other question has to do with the North Acton Fire Station design at $750,000. That's roughly 10% of the estimated cost of building a fire station. We have from the previous North Acton fire station uh, attempt uh, a, a lot of work on a three-bay station. Uh, the fire chief, when he was here, talked about it being not quite a cookie cutter, but like an awful lot of other three-bay fire stations. Why in the world do you need 10% for, for a, uh, a preliminary design for something which is practically designed itself? I mean, I know there are borings and sightings and things like that, but 10%, I should think you'd be able to drop that in half. Well, that, that might be, Bob, but I think if you look at all the work that goes into the design, the plans, um, you, know, there's, uh, the, you know, there's a feasibility study where the building should go on the property. Um, you know, 10% to us uh, was also what we had seen in other communities, um, quite frankly, and again, it's a, you know, an estimate that we believe, um, you know, is, is, a, is a good number. Uh, if it does come in less, then, you know, we can close that article back back out. But right now, that 750 was based on construction of similar facilities. Uh, Sudbury, I think, was one of them. Westford. Um, you know, they might have been a little bit bigger than our facility, but um, that was an estimate based on uh, data at hand. Um, and that's, and that's what I can what I can give you on that. Um, what, what kind of
kind of uh, useful lives are you talking about on these things? The design goes into the same as the building. So, if you look at if you're looking at bonding costs, um, design is five years, bondable building would be twenty. Um, so if you get out, I mean, if you're asking me to get out on the list here, yeah, the right, yeah. North Acton Fire Station, uh, that we have, we've uh, we've gotten approximately 50 to 60 years out of the current stations. So we'd assume, you know, a 30 to 40 year useful life on the North Acton Fire Station uh, to replace Engine 22. Those typically are about a 10 year useful life. Uh, South and West Fire Station HVAC improvements. You know, these are, uh, you know, again, HVAC improvements. They're probably 10 years, although I think the, the bond might only be five. The complete street program, any five years to 10 years useful life on that. You know, that's, you know, that that's probably light for the useful life because as you read in the article, um, some of the stuff would, would allow for, um, you know, a bicycle pass on some of these streets, and those clearly have a 20-year useful life. Acton Center traffic design, you know, 20 years. So th these have significant uh, useful lives. So and just roughly, and, and trying to answer Bob's question, we, the principal payments on these things are going to be a couple hundred thousand dollars, and, and plus the interest, whatever it is. So yeah, yeah we're probably talking $300,000 impact in FY20. Yeah, we'll we'll get the data out to the committee. Um, but yeah, year two, year one is interest only. Um, with a couple of these things having a five-year useful life, yeah, we'll we'll probably be up around the quarter of a million dollar range or so with uh, principal and interest on these in FY20. Okay. Any other comments, Bob? Other questions from the committee members? Thanks. Um, the fire engines every year, it seems like two years ago, it was 625,000, now it was 675, now it's 735. And they don't seem to be combining like two in a year to save on bonding costs and to save on, I mean, if we bought two, two years ago at 625, that got better than paying one at 735. And the, you know, so it just seems like they got to come up with a little bit better plan working with you to be able to do this so that we're keeping the taxpayer in mind where and I understand that the chief's argument where well, we don't want them all coming due at the same time. Clearly, I understand that. But I do understand, too, that every time we go to bond on these, there's a bonding cost for each vehicle. You combine two together, it saves on bonding costs. Interest rates went up three times last year. Predicted now another three. And even said today, the Fed uh, chairman even said today that it may even go four times this year. So we keep looking at this. Our, it, we have an escalation cost on interest alone. So if they did the two years ago and they bought two at 625 or even got it for 600,000 each, we would have been, we, I think we would have been better off in the long term and, and saving on interest and bonding costs, et cetera. And escalation costs of every year paying an increase in cost. So to the earlier part of your question, part of the reason why these costs are escalating uh, Last year, the appropriation included uh, some money for some e hydraulic tools and some other, you know, you know I, I wouldn't really call them bells and whistles because these are essential life-saving equipment. Oh, that, yeah. But, you know, we, uh, you know, more of a kind of a fully loaded cost with some, you know, e hydraulic tools and some, you know, now they, these jaws of life are very different. Uh, so that, that's why you're seeing somewhat of an escalation roll in the cost. Uh, in terms of the bonding, uh, we have, you know, you're right, we have not gone permanent yet, so we have not, we have a short-term loan out there. We're trying to, uh, for lack of a better term, we're trying to marry some some bandwidth of bonding activity. You know, we didn't want to go to the, the market with a million dollar long-term bond with, with issuance costs of 50 to 70,000. Um, you know, we have, we have taken your comments to buying two fire trucks versus one seriously. At the end of the day, there are so many, you know, different priorities that, and there's only so much money to go around, um, you know, that, that, you know, that concept 
you know, kind of fell through the cracks or, or wasn't considered. But we do hear what you're saying, that if we can if continue to propose a fire truck to get back on a, a good replacement schedule, um, it's something we should look at. Again, I, you know, to the point about the taxpayers, we, we just, you know, we're, we're trying to build a budget, level service budget, and on some of the capital, you know, there's so many, there's so many different competing priorities that, uh, you know, we just haven't felt it was reasonable to, to double down on the fire truck in any one given year. Yeah, Jason. Just to go back to the, um, the design cost, uh, we have some of the representatives from the school here. I think they would love it if uh, their feasibility study had been 10% of the uh, estimated cost of a school building. Uh, so um, I want to make sure I understand this exactly right. You're saying that if, you, if we approve this and you take out a bond that includes $750,000 for a design study and it comes in grossly under that because we're going to use one of the, as the chief, fire chief said just last meeting, we're going to use one of the designs on the shelf. It comes in at half or even less. We're going to have to continue to pay interest even though that money has not been used and will have been returned back. True or false? So if we float a long-term bond uh, that includes that cost. Uh, you know, depending on whether the bond had a prepayment, you know, some of our debt has prepayment penalties, some doesn't. Um, but, you know, I'm trying to, trying to wrap my mind around that, but we, we, could, we could end up paying that off, Jason, if, if we didn't use it, you know something? Or we've just taken out a loan and didn't need it. I think in the case there too, Jason, if, if we put out $750,000 for this acquisition, for this design study, and it came in significantly less, we can go back to a subsequent town meeting and reappropriate that money for the build, if you would, and just reduce that cost. So the citizens wouldn't be paying for something that they didn't get. So we can repurpose that money. You're making them pay now without actually having to do it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, is there any mechanism by which uh, we can approve only part of this or say that we do not approve of, the, of Section A and, or do we have to approve this as a package? Do we have to recommend this as a package or not? Um, well, there's no motion on the floor, but I, I would not be um, looking for a motion to separate this one out. It's, Mr. Only, Chairman? it's, it's less than $100,000. I don't think it's worth worrying about. Okay. It's $100,000 this year. It's $300,000 the next. Well, we may not even need it. And you'll be needed for construction. Yeah, it's not like we're not going to build it. Okay. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes. You know, one, one quick point, Jason, about the, uh, and the school folks are here too. Um, their feasibility study, if you try to line that, you know, appropriation, I think it was close to a million dollars. Okay. That is not, I don't believe that was for 100% full design cost. So I think if you're trying to line up, or if it was, right. So, so I think, I don't think you can line up, um, you, I don't think you can take the school's December vote of, you know, a million, million, one, million, two, divided by their expected cost of construction, and then put it up against the towns. I, I think you're, I think you're comparing, you know, apples and monkeys, but it's not, it, don't, it, it does not line up because I think, you know, you look at the, you know, the sewer project we did 15 years ago, you know, th those design costs are typically higher, but I, but I just don't think you can, you can use the school design costs and that ratio, um, you know, versus this, just a, just a thought. All right, Bob, do I have a motion? In a second. Um, your point, Steve, is that once these drawings are done, you could actually go out for bids for the building of the fire station. You're going to need no more design work. If that's true, and I accept your word of that, I think you need to be very careful in what you, in the presentation to town meeting to make that distinction clear, because having just come from a December meeting where a feasibility study could not have had full construction documents, and this one would, uh, town meeting members need to be made abundantly clear.
clear as to the differences. But uh, that being said, Mr. Chairman, know what they're going to build. I move that we recommend this article. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All right, then Article 8 um, has been moved that we recommend. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Nay. And abstentions. Okay, that was one nay. Gentlemen, I think we are done with you tonight. When did you I don't, want, I don't want to go to Kelly's Corner yet. You don't want to do Kelly's Corner yet? Um, I think there's still some questions out there. Okay. Uh, and I'd be more inclined to take it next time. Sure. Besides, I've got people from the schools waiting. <laughs> that could be a lengthy discussion. And so I would like to move to... Article 5, the Acton Box for a Regional School District Assessment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll see you in about uh, 11 hours at ALG. <laughs> start with, I know um, the superintendent sent out some answers um, this afternoon, which I forwarded on uh, questions that have been previously asked. So um, I guess I'll, we'll open it up to questions. Who has, who has remaining questions that need to be answered? Christy. Uh, thank you for your, your answers. I think they were mostly from JD about the maintenance. Um, I'd still like some more details in general. There were a lot of recommendations in the Durham Whittier report relative to roof repairs, whether they were under warranty, various things like that. We're looking at um, putting forth a really large building and spending a lot of money on it, and I'd like to see that there is an appropriate degree of maintenance, uh, money going to the maintenance budgets so that we can keep our old buildings going as long as we can, too. I went to a school that was built in early 1900s, and it's still up and running. You don't, you don't replace buildings in New York City like you do around here. So I'm used to an idea of you kind of keep the building going as much as you can. So I'd love to see that the budget reflects that as much as absolutely possible. Other questions? Oh, go ahead, Bill. <laughs> no, just thank you, Christy. Um, and I, I would like JD to just uh, respond to that. Uh, but first, just good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my first opportunity to be here at Finance Committee, so thank you for the invitation. And, if you're uh, lucky, you, this will be the only time. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm lucky. <laughs> uh, and, but I do, I, I do want to apologize for the lateness of the uh, Q&A document that we sent to you. Um, I, you know, it just got you got by me, so, so that's my fault, so I apologize. I know it would have been much more helpful for you to have had it quite a while ago, and I'm sure you didn't get a chance to read through all of it, so, so I do want to apologize for that first. Um, so let me think for a second. The, uh, and I'm probably going to ask for a little bit of clarification. The, I assume you're referencing the larger 800-page facilities assessment phase one document, right? Um, and uh, you're referencing some uh, information in there with regards to roof warranties? Uh, starting, I think, at the high school and some of the other yep. levels, there were problems with the roofing, and they said, look, this should be a 20-year warranty yeah. on this, and it's clearly yeah. cascading into other problems. I was just wondering how much of these general things have been I've only, I'm new to this, I've only seen. No, no, absolutely. I just want to make sure I can answer your question yeah. appropriately. The, um, so the high school uh, is still under a roofing warranty. 
uh, it will be uh, for another five years. And the junior high should be coming up and the Parker Damage should be coming up relatively shortly. If not already, I would have to check the dates. It's generally a 20-year warranty. Uh, and the Douglas School roof, ironically, would still be under a, school, a warranty because it was replaced <laughs> in 2007, if anyone remembers exactly off the top of my head. Um, you know, but the, uh, uh, I had talked a little bit about maintenance and, and maintenance budgets and future maintenance budgets and, and these questions, these set of questions. Um, uh, but, you know, just to, to kind of recap some thoughts around that, I, I, I truly believe from my perspective, and, and I've been here working on it for 15 years personally. Uh, granted, the first five I was pretty green. Um, but, uh, but I do think I have a pretty good, you know, sense of, of not just the, our funding initiatives, but also what the communities have been willing to, uh, you know, to fund and collaborate on together, you know, with regards to, you know, I mean, there is a, ALG goes through a process of deciding, you know, what, what kind of targets are we going to think about with regards to budget increases and what kind of capital is coming down the pipeline. and. You know, I think there's been efforts made in recent years. I don't know how well it's taken off. I didn't participate in it, but like a dual board capital planning, you know, board amongst the uh, town, schools, of, of both towns and schools. Um, but just to, you know, like I was saying, I, I believe that the schools have done a very reasonable job of, of funding, A, preventive maintenance. You know, I, I don't feel, uh, that we have massive shortcomings um, in, in that area as the person who administers it. Uh, I think we have a really good sound preventative maintenance plan. Uh, you know, we'll, uh, I mean, how can I prove that without just, just by saying it? Uh, you know, we can take a look at how the MSBA thinks we do when they issue our reimbursement number for that little piece because you can earn more points uh, for our reimbursement for the new school building project based on uh, what we currently do for preventive maintenance and budgeting, et cetera. Uh, so that, uh, there's a metric that we'll get from a third party. Uh, hopefully it's good <laughs> based on uh, my uh, responsibility for those areas. <laughs> but, uh, so, um, uh, so there's two points of extra reimbursement available for, uh, for that, that maintenance and, you know, uh, area with regards to, uh, and, and they're not just looking at Douglas, they're looking at how we as a district do it and how we as a community do it, quite frankly. Um, you know, so, uh, it, and I don't want to reiterate or just, you know, reread what I wrote in here. I'm uh, sure you can, you know, take a look at it. But, you know, I, th I think over a 20 year period, uh, they've, the, the communities here have balanced fairly well capital and preventive maintenance, you know, having, you know, going through chapter 70 reform when there was a little bit of a boom in some money. Uh, and then right into a recession where it was, you know, very, very tight. Um, but in the end, you know, we have $97 million of assessed value assets. And, um, and, and this is what I said in here. I mean, I, if you were to just Google like an industry sweet spot for what the maintenance and preventive maintenance um, budget should be for that amount of liability would probably be around 10%. And, you know, we're not, I want to say, we're not there now, and I don't know if we'll ever be there, you know, just because of the nature of community, you know, needs across all fire, you know, police, schools, et cetera. But, I mean, is that helpful at all? It is some. It's partially um, my question centers around the priorities mm -hmm. that show up in the budget. It looks like there has been a shift in the last few years, a, a significant shift mm -hmm. in putting money towards maintenance. Um, has there been, because I'm, I'm not in these discussions, yeah. is that a renewed commitment? Is that your understanding? Well, I can definitely speak to that. I mean, um, three years ago, if I got my budget cycles in my head correct, you know, we weren't really carrying proactively anything for capital. You know, the way we in the district did capital for years uh, was with um, either, you know, you know uh, end of the year uh, money or by some other funding mechanism that would involve, you know, uh, like the Leary Field Project, for example, which was the original 
three-legged stool project, which, you know, that euphemism has been, you know, used, I think, uh, several times over the last 10 years for other types of projects where you have a private funder and a, you know, you take some of your operating budgets and, you know, whatever the third leg might be, it could be CPC grant, could be DOER grant, it could be a number of different things, but, um, uh, but we, you know, we built it up to about Two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars the next year in terms of capital funding, up to seven hundred fifty the next year, with a goal of trying to get to about a million, which we kind of got to this year. Uh, you know, and um, I tried to pull out some projects that we talked about that were in that fourteen million that are listed in some of these questions, and um, uh, but you know I, I think we're moving in a in a fairly responsible direction. Good. Other questions or comments? Bob. <clears throat> now that you've opened it to comments, uh, mine is more of a comment than a question. Um, first of all, while it's a pleasure to see you three gentlemen, I'm astounded that no member of the school committee is here. I cannot imagine a time in the history of the town when the finance committee has held a budget hearing before town meeting and no member of the school committee has deigned to show up. I think it's an insult to, this, to the townspeople. I think it's an insult to the, to the, uh, to the finance committee. Leaving that aside, uh, as you know, we, we put out at the beginning of the year our point of view, uh, and we also made an effort, uh, as we did last year, to carry that point of view to others than the school committee and the selectmen who have to work on it. The group that I spoke to was at the senior center, so of course you might imagine that almost all the people in the audience were seniors, and their principal concern was the rapid rate of tax increases in the town and what could be done to mitigate them. And indeed, their principal concern was with the school budget and how they could in fact vote to reduce it. Uh, as you know, that's rather difficult, as I explained to them. Uh, but Social Security income went up by one 1.2%, your budget is going up, at least as Acton is concerned, by 39 You're talking next year about 4 or 5% increase in the operating budget, and yet you're going to come back to the town, including all of these seniors, and say, please increase your budget, your taxes even more, because we need a school. Uh, and I agree we need a school. But it does seem to me that at some stage, the school committee has got to concern themselves with the fact that they're placing an undue burden on an increasing percentage of the town which does not have great increases in income uh, and constantly sees increases in prices. And I, I, I just, I have not understood why uh, the school committee in the last few years has been oblivious to this. Uh, you've added, you have a school system which is not increasing in number of students, may increase, decrease slightly, but it's certainly not increasing. Yet you have significant numbers of additional personnel. Uh, you added assistant coaches, you've added this, you've added that, so you've decided to change the busing schedule, which the town has had for over 50 years, in order to save money so that money could be spent. It's, I think, one of these days, somebody's going to rise up and say no, and then the schools are going to have to deal with it. You can respond if you like. I, I appreciate certainly the comments. I, I didn't hear a question in there, though. OK. <laughs> Well, he didn't, he didn't say it was a question. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? Jason? I'll try to be relatively brief. A <laughs> um, couple of points that uh, you've probably heard from me before. I just, you know, like to beat a dead horse, so I'll do it again. And I, I thank you. I thank you, Paul, for coming tonight. Um, in one of the answers um, to my question about the Capital Planning Committee. And, and first of all, I'd like to say I, I have noticed that three years ago it was zero dollars for capital, and then for a couple of years it was $200,000. And I applaud you for having a million in capital in this current plan. I would like to, my first comment is I would like to encourage that go forward um, so that we do end up having an opportunity to get as many points reimbursement on the MSBA as we possibly can. Uh, you were in the room for that uh, building committee meeting when, when the topic of the no, uh, JD was in the room, I think you were as well, Superintendent, when we talked about the ability to get extra points and um, respectfully there was a, a peal of laughter that went up through the room. I think that's instructive. Um, 
In one of your uh, responses, Superintendent, you wrote the vision for the ABRSD capital planning going forward, not including large scale building projects such as the proposed new twin school, is to have an internal group, an internal group made up of key school staff members and reporting to the budget subcommittee. Uh, furthermore, uh, you and I had an opportunity to speak after the last ALG meeting and you commented that uh, you didn't feel it was commonplace or even necessarily appropriate for the wider town stakeholders to be part of that kind of committee. But looking at the responses from JD to Christie's questions that came out today, uh, he stated that, quote, this work will require the collaboration of all major boards and committees in both communities. While I'm not going to try and pin you down for a commitment tonight, because that would be inappropriate, I would, uh, I would definitely like to make the comment that the keeping the stakeholders involved, especially as we start going at a five-year time horizon, uh, will will stand you in good stead, and I, I want to encourage that as much as possible. And the corollary of that is, how do you feel about uh, my my idea for a dashboard, my dashboard idea, where we have some independent result, we have some independent thing to hold up, in this case, the Doran Whittier report. Um, and if you are able to hold up this report that has $120 million in deficiencies and we're able to retire it with in-house work, with smart grouping of projects, et cetera, et cetera, and we're able to show value on the town, um, is that an undue burden for us to ask of you to present that level of, of report? Is that something that can be tasked with this new capital committee well, work group that you're talking about? Because I firmly believe that if you're able to put in that effort and come both to the finance committee and to the board of selectmen and to the town meeting at large and say we were handed a $120 million bogey, we retired it for 30 million or we retired it or we're planning on doing it, this, that, and the other, it gives you an opportunity to shine. Not being able to provide that information or for now two years in a row being asked when are we going to address the health safety questions and not getting the answer to that, it does the opposite of shining. And um, I, would, I would love a response, but I'm aware of the fact that I did not ask a question. Again, you may respond if you feel appropriate. Thank you. <clears throat> Sometimes it's good to be an interim. <laughs> uh, but, but in all seriousness, Jason, I, I, I have a couple of comments uh, uh, regarding the capital planning process. So in reference to the statement I just meant, I just said it's good to be an interim sometime. Uh, you know, I'm learning as I go here. And one of the things that, one observation that, that I made and I, I had early on um, in our budget development process <clears throat> was that the district has uh, all of this information that was put together over the last couple of years through the uh, master planning process. And there are voluminous spreadsheets that identify uh, literally thousands of items. And, uh, and there have been a number of items that have kind of stood out over the last uh, two years that have been identified and, uh, and completed uh, th through uh, using, using uh, funds through the operating budget, uh, whether they were budgeted in the capital outlay line or uh, there were funds uh, that were available at the end of the year. Uh, but, but as you and, and others have noted, there, there is no formal process in place to, there hasn't been to date, a formal process put in place to cull all of that voluminous information uh, into uh, both uh, what I would call a midterm five-year plan and a longer plan to address those needs. In addition, uh, there are a number, what I've, what I've experienced is that there are, are a number of different big numbers out there that come from the work Doran Whittier did. So one big number is this $120 million number that 
as I understand it, is related to work that Doran Whittier identified uh, uh, in terms of, of uh, all of these capital needs, facility needs, and grounds needs, uh, but do not include uh, the cost of a new school. Is that right, basically? Yeah. So, and then <clears throat> there was an effort to identify major costs associated with the Douglas School, the Gates School, and the Conant School, which are three of the facilities, as you know, that uh, are subject to uh, subjects of the feas upcoming feasibility study. So, so those costs were put aside, and, and I think uh, when you add those up, th that was maybe a little more than $40 million. So that brought that $120 million down to about 80. And then that 80 was called down to this list of 14. Uh, I I'm not clear exactly what that 14 million represents in terms of, of uh, uh, I assume, the highest priority. So, and then earlier in the year, for the first time, I heard this $4.4 million of life safety items. Uh, I'm going to let JD address that because they're, they're, on the school side, there appears to be, quite honestly, confusion about that number. That needs to be. Yes. So that's, so, so, so that's one, uh, that's one of the pieces and JD will address that. Uh, in terms of not uh, our discussion about having town people involved, so uh, prior to that conversation, I was not aware of an effort that began 18 months ago, maybe 18 months, two years ago, to, uh, to uh, create a joint working group. So I wasn't aware of that, frankly. And uh, so, so what I can do tonight is certainly make a commitment that the, the, the regional school district absolutely wants to work with our partners in Acton and Boxborough on any kind of capital planning that happens. That, that's vitally important. Uh, right now, the way that we kind of envision that is at the district level, we would put together this five-year plan based on what we believe we know best about the needs. And then that, then we would share that and look for input and get together with, uh, uh, through a committee or however that structure, structure uh, goes moving forward to work on that uh, on, a, on a town school basis, both with acting and we need to uh, do the same thing in Boxborough as well. So, so no, we would welcome that, frankly. Um, and then the last thing I want to just emphasize is that given my observation and in talking with our leadership team, uh, we're all in agreement that we need to change the way we develop uh, the annual capital plan. And it needs to come from a five-year plan. And uh, I've been involved in different processes in the, in the various districts I've worked, but the one that I believe works best, or has worked best for me, is that the capital planning piece uh, happens in the uh, late uh, spring, early summer of the uh, preceding fiscal year. So, so for FY20, we would begin this process, you know, shortly after town meeting, frankly, uh, in April, May, and June. Uh, my goal is that we will have a, a draft five-year plan uh, by the end of the, uh, June that we can start sharing for feedback. Uh, those items, th those plans, the, the, the basis for that will be those items that come from that $14 million list and that $4.4 million list, wherever it might be. Uh, but, uh, and we need to do more work on that. And so, uh, so the, the cycle would be that, that, that is developed in year one, 
We prioritize what FY20 uh, projects would be. We, we continue to look at the one, $1.1 million in annual funding, at least I, I think for year one going forward, which would be FY20. And, uh, go th that, and that will all be, again, shared. The district's budget subcommittee would be reviewing it. And then based on the input and feedback from the towns, the, the subcommittee would then make a recommendation to the full committee for a capital number uh, sometime probably very early October. And once that was determined, or at least that would then be put aside, and the operating budget would then be, we go through our budget development process. Uh, that theoretically that would go forward. The FY20 budget development uh, process would, would be completed. We go to town meeting, and then the uh, capital subcommittee at the district level would then start its process again for year two, FY21, in April of 2019, I think. Yeah, if I have my right, 2019 or 20 maybe. But I think you, you're understanding what I'm saying. And then, but, but the important piece of that is we would then add a new fifth year so that, that there's always a five-year plan in place. So we're working on, on articulating that in writing and spelling out all the logistics and protocols for that. I've indicated to the school committee that I would bring, be bringing something to them during one of their April meetings. And uh, so th that's, that's how we envision that, that process. And then JD will, will address the 4.4 uh, million. Sorry. I, sorry, you have longer tenure than I do. <laughs> so it's like, take the bullets or something. Uh, you know, the uh, 4.4 million, um, you know, uh, I thought you were the source of that number, <laughs> to be frank. And, uh, you know, so I have two CIP type, I think part of the nomenclature is part of the issue because a lot of people are, have referred to the CIP as $14 million, refer to the CIP as $20, $120 million. I have two spreadsheets that are constantly open and being manipulated by me uh, in terms of updating line items. You know, one is the 120, the original CIP document, which I've edited and sorted, you know, a million different ways. And the things that fell into the life, health life safety category out of the 120 million was more than 4.4 million, you know. Um, and then of the 14 million, uh, the only thing I could think of where this 4.4, I, I, I've never said 4.4 million in any public meeting or presentation or anything like that. Um, I, I don't even think of it in that way. And, um, but the, uh, of the 14 million, if I went and looked at every one of those line items and, and cross-referenced which ones fell into health and life safety, would that add up to 4.4? Maybe. You know, but the, but the question that I thought was asked was what items have been completed that were health and life safety? I think we provided that, um, I think some of it's in here um, in terms of the projects. But the, the other thing that's a little bit different in terms of when we talk about these, uh, these projects in the CIP is you know, a lot of times, uh, when I think of them, I, I think of them in, in my dollar values, and they are significantly less than Doran Whittier's dollar values. Um, paging, paging the dashboard. Yeah, totally. I, I mean, and you know, the, the dashboard idea is great, and, and I appreciate you wanting us to look good and, and feel good. I, I, I don't lose sleep, you know, and I, I, I think I'm attractive, but I don't know if I look good in terms of professional sense. but. But the, the dashboard would be great, you know. Um, you know, is it is it overwhelming to, to put that together? Um, you know, I, I mean, you know, probably not. Uh, but if I have discretionary time in between, 
trying to get this building built and implement an entirely new busing system, you know, it's probably going to be to try and figure out how to save money, not, I you never know, suggested this yeah. all fall on your shoulders, J.D. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I'll fess up. I'm the source of the $4.4 <laughs> Um and it was nothing but a slice of uh, the original Dorn Radio report. Oh, okay. They categorized things, and, and the nomenclature was confusing because I think I forget what it even was. It was health, safety, environmental. I knew there wasn't a whole lot of environmental out there, <laughs> but um, no, they, there was a, a schedule of by belt, by building, by categories, and I took a slice right across the building and put it in my Excel spreadsheet, and it was 4.4 million. So, Mr. Cole, are you ready to make a motion? After an interesting month, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I move that we approve Article 5. Recommend, recommend Article 5. I move that we recommend Article 5. Is there a second? Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, Article 5 is in the amount of $59,981,959. So, all in favor of recommending Article 5, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay, any abstentions? Article 5 passes. Thank you very much. And, and uh, while I'm, I apologize for something earlier, I'll apologize for one more thing. Uh, and, and Bob, this is directed to you. Uh, uh, your initial comments I, I take to heart, uh, although I'm not on the school committee, but I think I'm the reason why it's, it's, then somebody, the chair is not here. And I apologize for that. She had, we had had a conversation and uh, there was some confusion about whether there was an expectation for a, a actual presentation to be made. and and. Our understanding was that no. there was not, and so uh, uh, my understanding was that we were going to be here and able to answer some questions. She asked me, do you think I need to be there? And I, I said no. So I apologize for that. But thank you for approving the rec recommending Article 5. You're welcome. All right. Um, as far as other articles go, Article 9, John, um, I'm having trouble with, um, well, it still says supplemental engineering and appraisal services. Um, the write-up never mentions the amount now. I mean, I just, I don't know what, <laughs> I don't know what we're voting. <laughs> okay. Um, let me just give you um, what the numbers are that break out to the uh, 469 figure. Um, it's two components. One is appraisal services, and these are to meet the federal standards because it's the federal monies that are going to pay uh, for the infrastructure project. So that's $125,000. Down about two hundred thousand. It has to be about about three twenty-five, but the um, state uh, Massachusetts is going to pick up um, the appraisals on the state highway, which is which is one eleven. So we're just going to do twenty-seven. Our figure is 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 um, one um, one twenty-five, and that is the under federal standards. The town has to hire an appraiser plus um, a review appraiser to determine what the what the compensation is. Then the supplemental engineering uh, design costs are three hundred and forty forty four thousand dollars, and how that gets divided up, sixty one percent of that amount is for the realignment and what they call signalization of Charter Road. 
um, 13 percent um, is a for the new signal at uh, Mass Ave and Community Lane. So that's a that's just across the street from CVS. Um, Seven percent is for additional services for the Hosmer property at 300 Main Street. And then 14% is what they attribute to amendments made to maintain access to and functionality of various properties. And then there's a contingency of, of, of uh, basically about 5% for, for other supplemental cost items. And that all goes into the, the 344. None of the information is in the write-up of the article at the moment. So, um, questions? So, John, turn your microphone off. Cause we might turn mine on. We're getting feedback. Questions for John on Kelly's Corner? Are we ready to vote? Okay. Then I'll entertain a motion. Um, I would move that we, um, uh, the finance would recommend um, Article 9, the Kelly's Corner Improvement Initiative, Supplemental Engineering and Appraisal Services to be bonded in the amount of $469,000. Is there a second? Okay. Discussion? Jason. Doesn't this feel early? Doesn't this feel like we don't have enough information to be able to do this? Um, I feel like we've had a first round. Now we're taking a second bite of the apple. We're going to get the appraisal numbers later. There might be yet another, yet another bite of this. And we still don't have a plan for what we want to do with Kelly's Corner other than we want to fix the streets in case something good happens. Um, I, don't, I don't see why we have to do this now. Well, the infrastructure improvements um, are intended to go forward whether we do something with Kelly's Corner or not. Um, things have to be done to ameliorate the tra traffic problem um, in that area. I mean, that's what, what this is about. Um, it's not going to take the traffic away. The school campus is still going to be there. The um, Roach Brothers Emporium is still going to be there. Um, it's not getting any better, um, but the, you know, what they fully believe is these improvements would, would ease the flow and the traffic's only become greater and greater. Other questions or comments? Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Um, all in favor of recommending Article 9, Kelly's Corner Improvement Initiative in the amount of 469,000 uh, signified by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Nay. Carries. Abstentions? <laughs> One abstention. Okay. Um, I think we've done enough Warren articles for tonight. A minute, minute could be quick. Do you want to talk to Minuteman, Mike? If it's quick. Uh, let's see. The, uh, 
Article 6, Minuteman Regional High School Assessment. Uh, this year, it will, uh, they're asking for, for the town of Acton, $1,303,814 which is an increase because of the new construction of $230,886. Um, the building project itself is, uh, the share of that is, is about uh, is one point, uh, one, one, one million one hundred dollars uh, and the project is going uh, hot and heavy. It will finish uh, 12 months early and will have significant savings uh, based on their $144 million budget. The end. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Jason. Sorry, uh, real quick. When's when's the anticipated opening date again? I should know this, but uh, fall of uh, uh, 2020. Uh, 19. Thank you. This is 18. The next a year from this fall. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay, Michael. Thank you, motion. I move that we recommend Article 5, the Minuteman Regional High School uh, Assessment. Six. 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 That's Article 6. Six. Article 6, sorry. Six. And Article 6 is in the amount of 1,303,814. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor of recommending Article 6, say aye. Opposed, say nay. Abstentions. Okay. Article 6 is recommended. Okay, now we are done with articles. Um, in a very short amount of time, Jason and I will be back at an ALG meeting. Um, Don't forget Janet. I'm Janet. Um, what you have uh, is a sheet called ALG Deficits and Remedies. Um, it was the third sheet and was stapled together. Can everybody find that? So what, what the top half of the sheet shows is the current um, ALG plan. Um, FY19 uh, by consensus is in, is in budget balance. Um, FY20 uh, as it stands now shows a, a deficit of 1.4 million. FY21 shows a deficit of 2.5 million. Um, a little below that, those numbers uh, are potential remedies to cure the deficits. Um, what I think Jason and I are looking for is um, a sense of which ones on this menu do you like best? Because we'll take that to ALG and, and we will um, work through a solution tomorrow morning. So. The first possibility is to increase the reserve use to the $2 million level from 1.3 where it stands now. Uh, $2 million is the amount of replenishment we expect every year, so putting in $2 million is like a reserve neutral position. Um, the next possibility is we equalize the amount of reserves we're using this year, um, same as those two years, so that's another 382,000 in reserve use. The next possibility is we chronically underestimate our tax revenue uh, by somewhere between a half of 1%, 1%, 1 
um, because we don't, um, well, if you look at historic tax levy growth, it's been over 4% for the last seven or eight years. Typically, what we have an ALG plan is something like 3 to 3.5% 3 of revenue growth um, because we don't re really account for um, some market valuations and things like that. Uh, we, we, we factor in new growth and we factor in 2.5%. But as I pointed out at ALG the last time, I didn't do any new growth and I still got a big increase in my assessment this time through. In fact, I didn't do anything. <laughs> It's Brian's out to get me, but but there was a, <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's a possibility. We can add in some revenue. We're not bound by the DOR guidelines when we talk about forecast years. We're bound by their guidelines when we talk about budget years, and they would not allow that for a budget year. The other thing we chronically underestimate is local receipts. So we could just say it's going to increase by 5.7%, which is, a, again, a fairly good historic number. Um, we could then talk about um, whether we want to do debt exclusions uh, for the Minuteman project, which we have discussed but haven't decided on at ALG, and for the um, FY19 bonding items, which by my estimate, whatever I did this, Bob, was about a $400,000 impact in 20. Uh, the other options are reducing the town expense growth to 3%, where it's 3.5 right now, and reducing the school assessment growth to 4%, and it's 4.25% right now. So, Roland. I'd like to see the town expense reduced. Mm -hmm. Three, I think that could be a starting point. And possibly a school assessment. Mm -hmm. Other comments? Yes. Christy. Could you please um, remind me of the, the debt exclusion? Is? Well, right now we have um, the costs of the Minuteman uh, building project in our numbers for FY20. Uh, in 21, but we don't. We haven't increased our revenue to account for it. Uh, it is a. It, it's a building. So um, many of the other towns in the Minuteman district have already taken out debt exclusions. A debt exclusion basically it's a tax increase, but it's not uh, part of the two and a half percent. So this, if you did it this way, it would require a vote at town meeting. It would require a vote at the town election, uh, but you would then get 296 more tax revenue. And debt exclusions require a two-thirds vote? <sighs> Bonding requires a two-thirds vote. Debt exclusions, well, it certainly doesn't require a two-thirds vote at the polls. I think if it passes, it passes. Um, I'm not sure what the town meeting vote would be. Yes, Christy. Would that, if it was a debt exclusion, would it expire over time? Yes, it expires when the when the debt excludes <laughs> expires. Sorry. Yes, Bob. Um, in this thing from Minuteman, which I assume Mike prepared, it looks like it's less than two hundred thousand dollars that we're paying for the building project. But comparing his numbers for our total assessment and assessment without the building project, but you're saving. Uh, almost $300,000 by excluding the debt. And I'm not sure, is this because the schedule of payments is rising as it does often in the early years, or what explains the $100,000 difference? This actually paid from Kevin McCarthy. The, uh, I'm sure that's the source of it, but right. you brought it to us. <laughs> well, yeah, the, uh, the cost because of the new construction, the, the assessments have increased include the construction costs. Um, the specific question is the $230,000 increase? No, the specific question is that, that Steve is saving by oh. by bonding, by excluding the debt for Minuteman, up close to $300,000. Right. But we're not spending $300,000 for capital in this year's budget. We're spending 
less than 200. I'm assuming it has something to do with it being the first year, Bob, because the, the ALG numbers show 189, 579 for FY19, and then 296. Uh, oh, I see. 296 after that. Okay. But, uh, that explains that. But it's a good question. So these are as of last week. No, but your sheet only talks to one year, I believe. Year, and, and I'm talking two different years. It's also it's significant. Other comments? Steve. Christy. Uh, so I would lean towards the school assessment to reduce to 4%. Um, they told us that this coming year was the most expensive for the new mm -hmm. uh, contract. Um, and when we asked them to come down this year, they found money rather quickly in, without actually making any uh, changes to how they were spending. Uh, so I would like to see them look more closely at their numbers. I would just point out that doesn't always happen. Many a year we ask them to come down and there's no movement, or very little movement. Yes, Christy. I uh, agree with Christine. I also am concerned that going forwards we've got the big school building project coming and the school's going to have to at some point be willing to cut um, their budget some or not grow them at the rate they seem to be used to growing them. It's not just our senior citizens who are concerned about paying taxes. It feels like the school's gotten kind of a free pass on how much they can increase because our reserves have been fortunate enough to recover to cover what could be viewed as their overspending. I don't think we can expect that to exist going forward. Them showing some ability to um, figure out where it needs to be cut would be helpful. Other comments? Tom. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if we've got a, a million four uh, problem to fix, you know, I'd, I'd recommend or suggest four of these. Uh, if we truly think that two million is kind of the, the naturally recurring mm -hmm. replacement and we're confident with that, then I would suggest that 700,000, that's half your problem right there. Yeah. Um, however, then I don't think you can take some of these others, the, the other tax revenues or local receipts, because using them would just diminish the, the turn backs, right? So you, you can't have both. So I drop down to the debt exclusion on the bonding okay. and the town expense and the school assessment, and that gets you just about your million four. Okay. Anybody else want to weigh in on this? Okay. Thank you. Next meeting, we will um, do the remaining articles. Um, in two weeks. Um, Is the 12th? Correct. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll get your copies. And you're going with John Benson. Thank you. And speaking of the point of view, Dave and I went to the high school during one of the snowstorms and they weren't open. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, as far as I know, that one has not occurred or been rescheduled, or if it did, someone else did it. It's been rescheduled for you and me on the 14th at okay. 7 o'clock. I was going to turn in all my handouts, but I'll hang on to them. Um, so we'll also review um, the warrant message uh, that night. We will. I'll try and get it out to you earlier than that, because uh, whatever changes we make need to be very few, because the warrant will go to press the next day. So. Um, 
All right, committee reports. Anybody? Town, town manager? Sure. Sure, okay. Um, we um, uh, went through 58 um, applications, um, for people who put in. Um, there were a few on monster.com, so they were in and out fast. Um, but we narrowed it down to 17. Um, one person, I guess, dropped out taking a position elsewhere. So we're, we're down to 16. Um, we sent essay questions out to those 16 to get a further understanding of them um, uh, to add on to their, their resumes. And um, 14 turned in uh, resumes, two didn't. Uh, we are meeting Thursday night to narrow the field um, to somewhere, probably see around 10 or 11 people who we'd, who we'd like to have in for interviews. And we'll have three nights of interviews the following week, the uh, 6th, 7th, and 8th. And um, shortly after that, we will uh, meet and our charge was to send up to the Board of Selectmen three to five uh, qualified applicants for them to further interview and select the next town manager. And I could, I could say, um, you know, my take on it is that we have um, got some, you know, very uh, good, um, capable people who I think would be, you know, very good matches for, for Acton. And uh, what, I, what I also understood, at least as a couple of weeks ago, um, none of the top people that we would be considering are in the hunt in other places. Yes, Roland. Are any of those currently a town manager in another town? Uh, oh, yes, yes. And that's all we can say. Any other committee reports? Yes, Christine. School committee. Uh, so the school committee um, declared its budget priorities going forward, which included spending uh, at least one million annually to address gap improvements, switching to the two-tiered busing and the change in start times and their new personnel. Um, the superintendent search continues, though uh, there are now only two finalists. Um, it's unclear in anything that I've heard why we're down to two, um, but, uh, but that is moving on. Um, and in fact, there are candidate nights tomorrow and Thursday, right? Uh, so if you were interested in meeting the candidates and you know, interviewing them, you can do so. Um, from your reconnaissance, um, do you know the reason why the Natick superintendent um, pulled out? He was the third finalist. No, there was um, just speculation with no foundation that I could that I could repeat. I mean, I don't not I have, you know I have nothing data specific or anything that I could clue you in. I'm you, I got nothing. Nothing through the grapevine. <laughs> Sorry. We're, we're not <laughs> speculating here. <laughs> sure. Um, that's 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 pretty much it. All right. Do you know, will it be televised Wednesday and Thursday? I don't know. Maybe somebody from Action TV might be able to tell us. <laughs> um, so who's which? Is it one candidate on Wednesday and one candidate on Thursday? Yes, yes, that's correct. And, the, uh, and then there was going to be a school committee meeting after. Uh, there's going to be a school committee interview after the public interview each night. Okay. And it's 6.30 in the junior high. Hold on a second. Let me make absolutely sure of that. Yeah, I think it's junior high, 6.30. I know it's 6.30. Yes, in the junior high. And the name first you want? Hang on a second. Well, John and I are only going to be able to go to one. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Maybe 
unless you need me to get it. No. <laughs> yes, Bob. The um, balance sheet for January for the Acton Health Insurance Trust shows net income for this year of $1.3 million and a total fund balance, including net income, of $7.2 million. Wow. No wonder you cut your rates. I found it faster than I thought I would. Tomorrow is uh, Anthony Parker, and Thursday is Peter Light. 6.30, Junior High Library. Okay. All right, any further, any other business that needs to come before the committee? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Tom. Mr. Chairman, I move that the meeting be adjourned. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all.